Hi everyone, it's Alexandra. If you're new here, welcome. Please take a second to click around and look around my channel, and you can check the description box below for more info. All views and opinions in this video are my own, as I'm not a teacher and this is not meant to be a substitute for your own research. In this video, we're going to talk about God and how to get to know him, as well as some common misconceptions about him. Because I'm still struggling with my health, I have enlisted a very good friend to help me with voiceover, so you will be hearing his voice as well as mine. Let's get started! God has been misrepresented for centuries by many religions and society, causing confusion for people who truly want to seek him. Let go of what the world has told you to believe about God and get to know him yourself. Unraveling the lies told about our Creator is an important first step in building a foundation on the truth. How can you have a relationship with someone you don't know? You can't. So. Who is God? God is the creator of heaven and earth. Because he created humanity, God is our Father. We are his children through Christ. The Word became flesh, the Word is God. The Father is the Son, and the Son is the Father. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is the judge. God wants everyone to know him and to be saved. Jesus came to restore our relationship with God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus is the only way to be saved. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 1.1 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. In the Gospel of John, Jesus made eight I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. The eighth I am statement is the most profound of them all. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is God, and God doesn't change. In Isaiah 44, 6, God called himself the first and the last. In Revelation 1, 17 and 18, Jesus uses the same descriptors. In Revelation 1, 8, Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Revelation 22, 13 includes all of the same descriptors. Jesus is God. They are not two different characters. God is Jesus, and Jesus is God. John 10.30 says, I and the Father are one. Esoteric knowledge cannot redeem the human spirit, as Gnosticism implies. The idea of salvation through knowledge has been around since the original lie Lucifer told in the Garden of Eden, that enlightenment leads to godhood. There are plenty of examples in scripture of Jesus' war on this form of self-aggrandizement and occult practices. For instance, Jesus knew the Pharisees were the keepers of the oral law, or tradition. They exchanged his words for the words of men. 
They thought they were enlightened or illuminated, but Jesus called their righteousness hypocritical in Matthew chapter 23, verse 27 and 28. In Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 36, Jesus calls the Pharisees fools, blind, and hypocrites seven times. The Pharisees continued to practice the occult ways of life they learned from the surrounding pagan nations, the Canaanites, Hivites, Hittites, Amorites. They never gave up their occult, esoteric teachings and have continued to spread them throughout the world in the form of mystery schools, Kabbalah, Talmudism, New Age, etc. Jesus' teachings are contrary to Gnosticism. What appears to be hundreds of different religions today are not. They share the same esoteric core of enlightenment through Gnosis. I discussed this in my mind game series, especially part one, which you can find a link to in the description below. Gnosis is the counterfeit Holy Spirit. His wisdom is not for some inner circles or groups. All people have the opportunity to learn the truth. Finding the truth is not easy. The only way to find truth is to read the Bible and separate the lies of the world from the truth given to us by God. 2 Timothy 2.15 instructs us to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Gnosticism is a self-centered ideology. God's grace is not something we can work for, it is a gift. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Being saved is an act of God. We cannot save ourselves. The systematic character assassination of God peddled throughout generations is based on the assumption that the God of the Old Testament is an oppressive despot and that Jesus is the inverse, a meek peacemaker. This falls into Luciferian ideology of two different deities, light and dark. As I've discussed, this idea is false. God is Jesus. There is no darkness in God at all. God has been painted as fickle and punishes mankind on a whim, as if God is part of cancel culture, but that's not true. God is not quick to punish his people at the first misstep. The truth is that the fallen angels who came down had children with human women, and their offspring were giants, or Nephilim, who killed and destroyed everything. Noah was told by God to build an ark to be spared from the judgment of the flood. 2 Peter 2.5 says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Noah most likely preached about the approaching flood for a long time, and he warned everyone of the need to repent. Offering the world such a warning would be in keeping with God's character, since the Bible shows he gives opportunity for repentance before his judgments. But no one listened to Noah. If they had, they would have been saved. If God had not intervened, all of humanity would have been wiped out by the giants or would have perished due to lawlessness. Many references to giants in the Old Testament are often ignored or de-emphasized. By omitting the giants, the children of the fallen angels, you only have half of the picture. To make up for this, God is often portrayed as both hero and villain. This is false. God's character doesn't change throughout the Bible. He warns people of the consequences of following the fallen, and unfortunately, most of the time, people don't listen. 
it's not God's fault that humanity ignores his warnings. God is patient and merciful, even in the Old Testament. When people rebel and turn from him, it's usually the absence of his protection and blessings that harm them, not direct retaliation from God. Good is not the opposite of evil. Evil is the absence of holiness. In scripture, when people opened themselves up to a fallen world, but later repented and asked God for forgiveness, he forgave them, like in the parable of the prodigal son. A story that is often used to villainize God is when God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Abraham knew the character of God and he trusted God. When Abraham and Isaac reached the mountain, Abraham told his servant, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. The text includes both Abraham and Isaac in the return trip. Later, Isaac asks where the lamb for the sacrifice would come from. Abraham says, God himself will provide the lamb. Again, he knew and trusted God and knew his character. God told Abraham that through him, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Acts 3, verses 22 through 26, tells us exactly what God meant. That blessing for everyone on earth was Jesus. The test of Abraham was a foreshadowing of Jesus and what God himself would do to save humanity. God tested Abraham's faith in regards to Isaac. It was not a human sacrifice. Isaac never died. God does not accept human sacrifices, unlike the bloodthirsty fallen, demons, and Nephilim. 2 Kings chapter 17 verses 16 and 17 details this. God is not Baal. Baal is a Canaanite and Phoenician deity. In artistic depictions and archaeological finds, Baal took the shape of a bull or ram and had associations with fertility. Baal is a title that means master or lord. The deity's name is Hadad. The full name was Baal Hadad. Hadad was considered the king of the gods by the ancient Canaanites. The name Moloch possibly comes from the Hebrew word Melek, meaning king. Moloch is often synonymous with Baal. Pagan altars found in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, where children were sacrificed, were described as altars to Baal by the prophet Jeremiah. Assyrian texts state that child sacrifices were made to Adad, which is the Assyrian equivalent of the Canaanite Hadad. In much the same way that God showed he was different from Baal Hadad by not requiring human sacrifice, he sent ten plagues to Egypt that challenged their gods. The Egyptian gods failed. God is also a title, not a name. 
In Revelation 19 verse 12 says, He has a name written that no one knows but himself. God knows when his children are calling to him. Beware of legalism and dogmatic doctrines. If you've seen my videos, then you know that I do not follow nor am I part of any movement, ism, or man-made doctrines. I prefer not to use Hebrew names anymore because I disagree with the movements that place far too much emphasis on correct pronunciations, and I don't want to be mistakenly associated with them. Personally, I like to use Abba, which means Father in Aramaic. Jesus' last words were also in Aramaic. He called God Eli, 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 lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Psalm 22 in the Old Testament used the exact same phrase. The Psalm of David is a prophecy of Jesus' crucifixion. Please take a moment to read these slides. Matthew 27 details the crucifixion and is the same as Psalm 22. The description of Jesus' crucifixion in Matthew 27 matches Psalm 22. Psalm 22 says they pierced my hands and feet, which equals the crucifixion in Matthew 27. Matthew 27 verse 35 even says that the casting of lots for Jesus' clothes was spoken by the prophet. Psalm 22 verse 18 says they will part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. In Matthew 27 verse 46, Jesus wasn't questioning God or asking why God left him. Jesus' death fulfilled the prophecy in Psalm 22. With the Aramaic phrase, he showed everyone watching him die, especially the chief priests, scribes, and elders who had him crucified, that his crucifixion had been prophesied by King David and that he was, in fact, God. Most people understand that God and Jesus refer to the God of Scripture. God is much bigger than spelling or pronunciation. Jesus is bigger than a name. He is the almighty creator of heaven and earth. He knows if you are his child. You can call him by one of his characteristics as long as you haven't taken his name in vain. He is perfect. He will not make the mistake of misjudging someone's heart. Your faith and your actions prove who you worship. You cannot worship God and the world. If you have the Holy Spirit, He knows you because you know Him. Matthew 7 verses 21 through 23 shows Jesus is not impressed by those who simply call on His name he judges your faith, works, and actions. There is only one God. There are no other gods. There are only fallen angels pretending to be gods. Even the demons bow before God and are terrified of Jesus' judgment. God is infinite and so much bigger than just how you pronounce his name. We must understand his character his eternal existence, and what it means to take his name. God knows who our hearts are referencing when we speak to him in any language. God also knew occultists would change important information.
The symbolism throughout the entire Bible has everything to do with marriage and agape love. God promised himself to the Hebrews on Mount Sinai. Jesus, who is God, came to save not only to the Hebrews, but also the Gentiles, or everyone. He is coming back for his bride, as it says in Revelation 19, verse 7. When you take someone's name, it means you've gotten married. When you take their name in vain, you made a promise you didn't intend to keep. Jeremiah 23, 26-27 shows this betrayal. God is differentiating himself from Baal, and he's lamenting the fact he has been forgotten, cast aside, or rejected by people who claimed to love him. They took his name in vain. After the exodus of the Hebrews from Egypt, God made a covenant, or a betrothal contract, with the Hebrew people. The terms of the contract were the Ten Commandments. Jeremiah chapter 2 describes how Israel loved God at first. But Israel committed spiritual adultery. After repeated attempts to have the Hebrews worship him, they refused and continued to worship the fallen. God was forced to give Israel a certificate of divorce since Israel had taken his name in vain. Here, Israel is the personification of spiritual adultery, not a literal woman. God has the same character traits in both the Old and New Testaments. Hebrews 8 describes the new covenant that was fulfilled by Jesus. Revelation 3 verse 12 describes the end of the engagement and the beginning of the marriage. The marriage symbolism continues in Revelation 19. In Revelation 22, John sees the throne of God and of the Lamb and says, No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Having God's name on our foreheads indicates who we trust, who we believe in, who we are married to, and whom we're sealed or marked by. Many of God's names describe his characteristics. For example, Emmanuel, God with us, the Messiah, faithful and true, the Word of God, Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, I am that I am, King of kings, Lord of lords, and the one who is and was and is to come. God moved prophets like Moses and apostles like Matthew to write the books of the Bible. It is not one book, Many books make up the Bible. There are 35 authors attributed in the Bible, and another five or so books where the author is unknown, like the books of Judges and Hebrews. Through time, translation errors can occur. Anyone who knows more than one language understands how easy it is for certain things to get lost in translation. 
words change, but the gist is the same. This is why it's important to study various translations of the Bible. Overall, God protected his word as a whole. The essence is there. Don't be afraid of reading it. The worst thing you can do is not read it. Don't let anyone decide who God is for you. If you want to build a relationship with God, get off the internet. By that, I mean spend time with him. Memes and random people's opinions, mine included, are not going to build your personal relationship with him. Don't be dependent on systems and other people's opinions. Think for yourself. Once you have a good foundation, then you can entertain ideas without being swayed into accepting them. Test the spirits. Carefully consider everything you read and hear, and always compare it with scripture. Researching objectively and discerning the truth is much easier when you have a good relationship with God. The Bible is a living book. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives understanding. The Bible will also be sealed and won't be understood by those who don't know him or reject him. John 14 verse 26 tells us, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The truth withstands questioning, and if you're sincere about looking for truth, you will inevitably find it. The truth proves itself. It will always triumph over lies. God and Jesus are the same. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are one. The Old Testament God is not quick to anger, and New Testament Jesus is not a pushover. In the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5 verse 17, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The Older Testament was not done away with by Jesus. Instead, the law was fulfilled completely so that we would not have to find our righteousness in it, but in the person, the law, the writings, and the prophets pointed to, Jesus. The laws, like the Ten Commandments, were given to show us a way out of this fallen world and how to have a relationship with God. Adam and Eve were the first to sin, but God did not give up on them. Later, he was rejected by the Hebrews, but God himself still provided a way to get back to him through Jesus. He didn't just give up and leave us. His commandments were a gift to his followers to escape the curse of the fallen world around them. The commandments given in the Old Testament are embodied in Jesus. God told the world his law, and Jesus showed the world his law. Jesus is the door, the escape. There is no rest or help or freedom without him. He is the only way out. As I've shown in the Mind Game series, especially in part one, all other philosophies, beliefs, and religions lead to death. There is no one as powerful, righteous, strong, true, faithful, and trustworthy as the Almighty Creator. No great architect, Norse mythology, pagan history, scientism, or new age teaching can bring anything other than death because they are all based on the original lie told by Lucifer in Genesis 3, 2 through 5.
God knows we'll have to endure many trials and tribulations in our lives and in this world, but he promises us a new one. If you're still breathing, then you have the ability to repent, which means to hate your sin and ask Jesus to change you and your desires. He will forgive you. There are no degrees of sin. Sin is sin, and Jesus' blood covers them all, period. You have to be willing to change, but change is only possible when you admit you want it. Jesus is in you, but you are not Jesus. There is a difference. It doesn't mean you'll never sin again, but you don't have to be a repeat customer. The Holy Spirit can take away the desire to sin. Worldly things lead people into sin. This fallen world is not where we belong. It's an exceedingly godless world, steeped in Luciferianism, demons, principalities, and wicked rulers in high places, emanating the Antichrist spirit. Sometimes it feels impossible to live in this corrupt world, but Revelation 14 verse 12 tells us, Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We're enduring this world until we can be where we're meant to be, with Jesus. To endure means to suffer something painful or difficult patiently. A perfect, holy world is described in Revelation 21. A place with no evil, a place absent from the fallen. And while we endure life, the rules of the game are clear. Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. He is our way out. That's why it's time to choose a side. You cannot live in two kingdoms at once. You must choose one. Lucifer's kingdom, this fallen world, or the kingdom of God. God stands up to cross-examination. Lies do not. The hypocrisy so many see does not get to represent God. Don't judge Jesus because of hypocritical humans. Get to know him yourself. The Holy Spirit can be recognized in people by the fruit of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So to anyone who has been hurt, abused, bullied, belittled, misunderstood, or made to feel like God hated you, ask yourself if the way you were treated reflected the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Of course not. So it's not logical to reject God based on the actions of hypocritical humans who do not embody the true teachings of God. If you've not seen the fruit of the Spirit for yourself, if you've walked away from God because of abuse suffered at the hands of so-called Christians in or out of a church, or if you're tired of the hypocrisy, you might be expecting me to say, just give it one more try. I'm not. You are right to leave the hypocrites and the conditioning and misuse of the Word of God behind. But it is a mistake to throw out the truth in that process. Don't judge the Father based on the actions of men. You have a unique personality and unique talents and skills for a reason. Not everyone thinks the same, and that's okay. We all have different gifts and different struggles. There's no right way to be for God to love you. You are his child, and that's a reason enough. Mm -hmm. 
Now it's up to you to do your part and love him back. When you repent and ask him to save you from being a prisoner trapped in Lucifer's kingdom, you have a new king and are part of a new kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. You do things that glorify your new kingdom. You're not stuck in the old. You can't live in two places at once. All the things we talk about on this channel, like the Luciferian lies that make up this world, are what we have to stop believing, participating in, and following. Warn others about the deceptions and stay focused on God, not on this world. A relationship is not a set of rituals you must perform to be worthy. It's about knowing you simply cannot live without someone. It's not about ritual. It's about action. It's about care. You act on your knowledge because you care. Keeping God's word in your heart and in your actions is worship. Go to the word and just learn about God. Take a walk and pray. Stop trying to learn exclusively from men. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. Stop reading books written by men about God. Read the books the prophets and the apostles wrote from God. The only facts are from God. The more you know him, the more discernment you get, which is the antidote to deception and lies and fear. Prayer isn't a wish list. It's an honest and constant dialogue. Not vain babblings, as described in 2 Timothy 2 verse 16, or rituals. It's about thanking him for our blessings, asking him to help us forgive others, and rebuking and binding evil in his name. Prayer is not about what can God give me or do for me, but what can I do for God? What does he want me to do? Seeking and living for God is not something you can do online or by looking at a few posts to learn about God. It is incredibly personal, difficult, lonely, and can be painful at times when you begin unlearning all you used to believe and realize this world has nothing for you. Take it one day at a time, trusting in Him. Exchange your plans for His. Truly living for God shatters your belief system and ego, and that's the best part. It hurts at first, but when He begins to reshape you, you get further and further from this world and have a sense of peace and hope no one can take from you. Is it hard? Yes. Is it worth it? Absolutely. What does it mean to be saved? Well, it means that you belong to God. So how do you do that? It might be the most important thing you ever do. The gospel is the good news of God's plan to restore our relationship with him through Jesus. Sin has separated us from God. All of us are guilty of sin. The penalty for sin is death, but God provided a way out, Jesus. Jesus foretold his death and resurrection to his disciples. Jesus lived a sinless life, but he took the punishment we deserve and paid our debt for sin with his blood. He is the final atoning sacrifice. We can only be saved by God's grace and by faith in Jesus.
By accepting God's gift of salvation through Jesus, we have the hope of eternal life. God restored our relationship with Him through Jesus. There is no other authority under which you can be saved. There is no other cause under which you can be saved. God says there is no other way but through Him that you can be saved. God is Jesus, and Jesus is God. Pronunciation of names can change throughout languages and countries, but the character does not. It means you can't be saved by enlightenment through knowledge, by science, or by any religion, figure, or philosophy. Faith is one part of salvation, the other part is repentance. The Greek word for repent is metanoio. It has two parts, meta and noio. Meta, or change, and noio, or disposition, it means to change your disposition towards life and reality. Genuine repentance is an inner change of heart that produces the fruits of new behavior. Acting differently, speaking differently, and living differently, these are the fruits. They are an outward result of being made completely different on the inside. That's repentance. Faith is trusting that Jesus is who he said he is, and that he does what he said he would do. Repentance is turning from old ways, old behaviors, and old beliefs. We no longer do what the world wants us to do, but what God wants us to do. Once we're saved, Jesus gives us his Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. God will reveal himself to you through the Holy Spirit. Salvation only comes through faith and repentance. Believe that Jesus is who he said he is, ask for forgiveness from your past sins, and make a conscious decision to change your life. Accept Jesus as your Savior and allow the Holy Spirit to be your teacher. Read the first five books of the New Testament to learn more about Jesus and his promise to give you the Holy Spirit. Jesus was God in the flesh, he preached the good news of salvation to all people. The Pharisees wouldn't accept that Jesus was God, and they made Rome crucify him for blasphemy. He died, was buried, and on the third day he rose again. He defeated death and lives forever. He is coming back for his bride, the ones who took his name.
it's okay to question what you've been told about God. He is truth, and truth stands up to questioning. Now is the time to get to know him yourself. Thank you for watching this video. I hope it made some of you reconsider what you thought you knew about God and reminded you how powerful our Creator is. Bye everyone. Romans 8, 38 through 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord.